God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, by showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your nature. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. A reading from letters, the letter of Paul of the Corinthians. The message about the, about the cross is foolishness to those who are foolishness. But to us, who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. For we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying, God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, we are right in the middle of Lent now. It's the third week, so three, three down, three to go. Um, and I think we need uh, uh, some words of uh, encouragement to keep on this journey. And 
miraculously or whatever it is, we have them here today. Let's, let's think about the gospel first. I have it here. This is quite a shocking view of Jesus, is it not? He's violent. He makes a whip out of reeds, and I guess he's swinging it around at all these people who are in the temple, selling the sacrificial animals and changing the money into the temple coins. And he also is full of zeal, as his disciples remember. Zeal is a word that in, in Hebrew describes the color of your face when you get really excited. You know, we tend to turn red or a darker color when, we, when we're excited or angry or whatever. So Jesus is making a spectacle of himself here. And the weird thing is he's not this violent in the other three versions of this. It occurs in every single gospel. But the weird thing is that he is so, is so violent here, yet he says not what he says in the other three gospels, which is, this is a den of robbers. Sounds pretty serious to me. But he says, you are making my father's house a marketplace. Well, of course it's a marketplace. This is the temple where you go on a big <laughs> festival like the Passover. It's in Jerusalem. It's the place, the only place you could go. And you offer sacrifices. So you're going to buy a bird or a, a sheep or maybe even something bigger. That's what you do. And as I said, when you make offerings in the temple, you have to use the temple currency. So you do have to change money in that sense. It's not like coming from a foreign country. So these people who are sitting there in there at their tables are just doing what they always do. Why is Jesus so mad at them? It seems, it seems kind of odd. The temple's been doing this for a long, long time. Well, I think that John, and remember, the Gospel of John is unusual. Uh, in comparison with the other three, a lot of times, John is showing us that Jesus doesn't want us to just keep doing the same old, same old. Even if it's a big festival, like the Passover. Or for us, Easter. We can observe these religious rites, which is wonderful, but are we observing them in our heart? Are we really understanding what God is saying to us and doing for us? Or are we just kind of, oh, okay, do we order the, the palms? Do we have enough wine? Let's make sure that we've got the right hangings. I mean, all these things are important, but is that what goes on in here? It can be a part of it. But Jesus is saying, don't just do things like you've always done them. Don't just get stuck. Don't be inert. He wants people to think about what they're doing before they do it. Now, whether that means changing what they're doing or just doing it with a different heart, hard to tell. But clearly, he's making a big noise. If I were his mother, I would have been humiliated to, to go to church with my kid and have him act up like this. And this, you know, was a 30-year-old kid. <laughs> these, these are much better behaved. <laughs> um, but he, he's really making a spectacle of, a spectacle of himself. Well, and, and there's a good reason for it. And, and in fact, I don't want to say good, it's God's fault, but you know, God is a little bit part of this thing. The psalm is, is a perfect psalm again for today. It's just a, it's a very old psalm, I believe, in the um, collection of psalms. It might actually be two psalms, but that's kind of irrelevant here. But the first six verses show us how good God is to us. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. God has created the universe that we live in, not to mention created us, right? One day tells its tale to another, and the night imparts knowledge to another. So God creates this magnificent universe where everything works perfectly, and it goes on and on and on, which is a good thing. It's, it's nice to get up and see the sunrise, right? Or at least you know, see the clouds get a little brighter, depending on where you live. But maybe we take it for granted. 
do we recognize that we have a role to play in this creation? That this isn't just going to keep happening the same way for everyone if we just sit there and watch it? We don't try to make it run the way it's supposed to, to help clean up things. For example, if someone is living on, on the street, is that person happy to see the sun come up? Maybe not, because maybe someone's going to come along and say, you can't sleep here anymore, go away. Or maybe it starts to rain, and they have nowhere to go. So there's a lot to this creation just rolling along. We have a role to play in it, rolling along the way that God wants it to roll. And that's where we get to, in the psalm, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord are just. So along with creation, God also creates for us a handbook, a way to live. And we've read it twice today. It's the Ten Commandments. Right? So we, we, we know what to do. Here, and we have a one-page version of it. Yes, actually we've got it on one page, on page three. So, there you go. Read that, carry it with you, and you're good. Is it that easy? No, perhaps. Uh, that's the problem. Again, we get complacent. We get inert. That's a terrible word. Uh, we don't move. Or, you can also be inert and just keep going in the same direction. If you go in the same direction and it's not a good direction, things get worse. Not just the same, but worse. And I wonder if that is what we have to work, work with, work against, transform, uh, whatever, however you see it. Look at Paul. He talks about the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now his idea, I believe, of who's perishing is people who aren't paying attention to the laws and statutes of God that are written in the creation itself. You don't have to be Jewish to, to pay attention to these. It just helps to have the Ten Commandments as a, a little, uh, little uh, thing to remember. Being, sometimes doing what's right, doing what is good, what fosters the beauty and the richness of creation for everybody, seems foolish. Like donating money to a good cause. Sometimes people are like, why on earth are you doing that? Um, I think we've all heard stories of um, someone who has lived alone all of his or her life and has had a just a, a very ordinary job. And when that person dies, they left a million dollars to the school district or something. And obviously they were not living high on the hog during their life. But they saved that money and gave it to something that needed it. Right? That's one of the things that that we can be doing, that the world might think, what on earth, this is bizarre. Why would you do something like that? Why didn't you buy a bigger house or a newer car or whatever? Now, I, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a bigger house or a newer car, but it's what are we doing in this world? Okay? And I think that, I'm losing my train of thought here, so let me think. Okay, Paul. Paul talks about the world. I think I'm losing my train of thought because I really dislike calling anything bad. Um, because you have to have God's perspective to be able to judge good or bad. But I think what Paul is saying, and I think he's right, amazing result, um, is that the world has a habit of kind of not moving that much and also admiring those things that are kind of glitzy exciting and that maybe cost a lot of money. You, know, you just have to watch the news to see you know, people with a, who are famous or are very rich or whatever, they're the ones in the news. And that's fine, unless all of what they have and what they've been doing for themselves comes crashing down. But we see a lot of that now. And we're seeing a lot of that right now. I don't know that it's any more or any worse, it's just we're seeing it. We have better communications these days. Uh, but when you look back at the, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, things like uh, don't steal 
which means taking things for yourself that maybe somebody else needs, uh, coveting things that belong to your neighbor, um, murder, adultery, honor. Do you honor your father and mother? Do you rest for a day? Or do you just keep working to get more and more and more and more of whatever it is that you really want? That's the influence of the world. And you know, I, I hate to, to say it's always bad, it's always bad. It's, it's bad if it doesn't work according to God's plan. Right? Money is not bad unless it's used badly. So that's what Paul is talking about. The foolishness, what seems foolish to the world, is what Jesus did. Jesus went and died on the cross. For what? To show us that we don't live for ourselves. We live for everyone. We live for God. That's the important thing. And if it takes dying physically to show people that, he's going to do that. That is the wisdom of God. That is not the wisdom of most of the world. There's no parts that are good, right? So how do we do this? Well, we keep these laws and statutes. And what they do for us, this is verse 9 of this wonderful psalm. The fear of the Lord is clean. So when we fear can also mean respect, the awe that we have, the respect we have for God. And clean, this is a weird translation. It really means cleansing. The fear of the Lord, the respect for God, the keeping of God's laws and commandments cleanses us inside and out. The psalm talks about secret faults and presumptuous sins. These are things that we do inside when we covet, when we don't feel good enough, so we go and do something stupid. When we want things, when we get mad at people that we don't need to be mad at because they, they're doing something we can't do. Um, all these kinds of things. See, what we're doing inside is the beginning of everything we do in the outside world. So that's what fearing God, loving God, respecting God, keeping God's commandments, that is what cleanses us. So we don't do this stuff as much. And we're not inert. We're moving in the right path. We might have been going this way very slowly, but we can go this way a lot faster and do better. We can live the way God wants us to live. So I believe that's what Jesus was doing and why John describes Jesus as really being shockingly violent. Not to be violent for its own sake, but to say, if you're going to keep doing the same things, you better do it with the right heart. And maybe you need to do things a little differently. Right? We can all use that advice, can't we? Yeah, this, the, the world is a, it's a tricky place to navigate, but we have, we have a handy-dandy one-page reference guide and we have wonderful psalms that show us that we need to look inside as well as outside. And we have this, the beginning of this psalm, the whole psalm, which tells us that God gives us things that are more than much fine gold, sweeter than honey. And that when we love God, we are acceptable to God.